In this part of our conference, we will learn about the studies of the founders, leading experts who have been conducting their research on the topic of near-death experiences for more than 20 years. We will learn why it is so important to study near-death experiences and how does it help us in understanding life after death. Why did the NDE's skeptics suddenly become researchers in this field? Also, we will hear the opinion of experts and their conclusions stating that after cardiac arrest, consciousness can remain active. Of course, we will hear the stories of people who have had near-death experiences. They will share what they encountered while leaving the body. We will learn what happens to consciousness after death. To answer these questions, let's consider the experiences of those who scientifically studied these cases. And right now, let me introduce a very respected doctor from whom we had the pleasure to interview. From more than 20 years, cardiologist Dr. Pim Van Lommel has studied near-death experiences in patients who have survived a cardiac arrest. In 2001, he and his fellow researchers published a study on near-death experiences in the renowned medical journal, The Lancet. He's also an author of the bestseller, Consciousness Beyond Life. I'm uh, Pim van Lommel. I'm a Dutch cardiologist uh, uh, living in the Netherlands. Um, uh, from 1986, I started to be interested in the death experiences because I had the privilege to talk to patients who survived the cardiac arrest. So um, my opinion was always that consciousness is a product of brain function. That's what I learned in university. I learned in medical school. And uh, when I started my specialization in cardiology in 1969, I was working one of the first coronary care units in the Netherlands. Um, coronary, coronary care units were started because resuscitation techniques were becoming possible. So, we started, there was a possibility to, to do electrical defibrillation on the chest, and we have external chest compression. Is it all these studies were published in the, in the 60s. Okay, sure. and so I was working in one of the first coronary care units in the Netherlands. Before 1967, all patients with, coronary, with cardiac arrest died because modern CPR techniques were not that possible. Now, in that coronary care unit, we had a 44-year-old patient with who got a cardiac arrest because of his myocardial infarction. And we had given him in several shocks, electrical shocks, because of the defibrillation. And he regained consciousness after about four minutes. And we, as a resuscitation team, and I was a doctor in charge, we were very, very positive and enthusiastic. It was all new for us. But the patients seemed to be very, very disappointed to be back. And he told me about going through a tunnel, seeing a light, hearing beautiful music, seeing wonderful landscapes, etc. Um, the death experience were not yet well known at all. And uh, I did not do anything with this uh, patient, and I did, but I did not forget what he had told me. Um, and until 1986, then I already uh, read the book by George Ritchie, Return from Tomorrow, where he describes a very deep and extensive death experience as a medical student. He died in 1943 because of double pneumonia and antibiotics were not yet available. So he was declared death and his body was covered with a sheet. And the nurse was so upset that this medical student had died that he was able to convince the medical doctor to give him an injection right into his heart, and after a period of death of nine minutes, he regained consciousness. And he had a very, very deep uh, death experience. Uh, from that time, because of scientific curiosity, I started to interview patients uh, in my clinic and our uh, patient's clinic. 
who had survived the cardiac arrest if they had memories from the period of unconsciousness, from the period of uh, cardiac arrest. Because according to our current medical science, it should be not possible at all to have memories of a period of enhanced consciousness with memories, with emotions, with the possibility of perception out and above the body. And only in 1975, Raymond Moody has written the book Life After Life, which I did not read before. So uh, I took my surprise within two years, between 1986 and 1988, I had 50 patients who had survived the cardiac arrest and 12 patients shared the MD with me. So now my scientific curiosity started to grow because it should not be possible. Uh, to have an experience of consciousness during current arrest. And until that time, there were, have only been retrospective study with a good selection of patients because who is going to react to an uh, advertisement of true conference? And uh, it also, also is a problem that you don't know after 20 or 40 years what exactly were the medical circumstances that people had died. So there were some theories about lack of oxygen in the brain, uh, neurotransmitters, uh, hallucinations, dreams, etc. So uh, to find an explanation, more scientific explanation for the cause and content of an ND, we started a prospective study in the Netherlands in 1988 in 10 Dutch hospitals. And uh, we had, we included a total of three hundred. Uh, 82 patients, 62 patients who survived the cardiac arrest. So they were all consecutive patients. And of those 362 patients with cardiac arrest, 80% uh, had a near death experience and 82% did not report an MVE. Now the question is what is the difference between the 80% of patients who report an NDE and the 82% who do not remember anything from a period of consciousness. And the people with the NDE told me all the classical elements of a near-death experience, which is, which is um, being out of the body, having perception out of body of the body, being aware of being dead, uh, being a dark space, going through a tunnel, uh, arriving in an otherworldly dimension with beautiful colors, beautiful landscape, beautiful music, meeting a, a being of light, uh, with a feeling of unconditional love and acceptance, and unknown wisdom as well. And within the, with this being of light, you have, can have a life review that you relive your whole life as well. Uh, you can meet deceased relatives. You have can have communication with them as well. Uh, you sometimes they have a, a flash forward. They see future events of from the from their own life, in the future. They can come to a border and they know when I cross this border, I will never come back. Then there will be a voice or the being of light. Or deceased relatives will tell them, "You have to go back. There's no. You have still a task to fulfill." And then they come back into the body, which is a very awful experience because you are back in your body with all the pain and the script uh, of, your, of your disease, like traffic accident, cardiac arrest, myocardial uh, infarction, etc. So uh, we found that there was no difference at all between the 80% of patients who reported the NME. The 82% who did not report anything, any memory. So the duration of cardiac arrest, two minutes or eight minutes, didn't matter at all. The duration of unconsciousness, like five minutes or three weeks in coma, didn't matter at all. A complicated CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation with the need of artificial respiration, didn't matter at all. Uh, a short uh, cardiac arrest in induced cardiac arrest in the, in the cath lab, did it not at all. So the severity of lack of oxygen in the brain did not play any role in having a near-death experience. It was quite unexpected as well. So we could exclude 
a physiological or medical explanation for the NDE. And we could also exclude a, a psychological explanation, so fear of death before the arrest did play any role. There was no pharmacological explanation, so that the medication did not matter at all, so it was not a side effect of medication. Full knowledge of Eddie, that you know that these kind of experiences are possible, did not matter at all. Uh, a demographic explanation like gender, age, uh, religion, if they were Christian or atheist, did it matter at all. Education did it matter at all. So, to our big surprise, we couldn't find any scientific explanation why people report a death experience in cardiac arrest. In cardiac arrest, is that people were clinical deaths. They were, were unconscious because of lack of circulation and lack of breathing. And when you don't start a CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, within five to 10 minutes, the people will die because of irreversible damage to the brain. So you have to start CPR as soon as possible. So people with the cardiac arrest are in the first stage of dying. Now perhaps I should explain a little bit about what a near-death experience is. A near-death experience is the reported memory of a period of unconsciousness uh, with several, several universal elements, as I told you before, like being aware, aware of being dead, the terminal experience, uh, being out of the body, with the possibility of perception, cognition, emotions, being a being of light, meeting deceased relatives, and a conscious return to the body. And this kind of experiences can happen during cardiac arrest, so damage to the brain. It can also happen in uh, loss of blood and complicated childbirth in young women. It can happen in uh, brain trauma, cerebral trauma, like in traffic accidents or mountaineering accidents as well. It can happen in uh, near drowning in children. But this kind of NDE-like experience can also happen in severe depression, in existential crisis, in, in isolation or, or meditation. So also in periods where the brain does function normally, you can have this kind of NDE-like experiences as well. And a very special element of this near-death experience is the transformation, which means people change lifelong and the uh, near-death experience took only two or three minutes. Uh, and the transformation we hear is there's no fear of death anymore. There's a new insight was an important in life, which is unconditional love, empathy, compassion, first towards yourself, Love yourself and accept your negative aspects we all have. And then uh, to feel connected with everything, every, every, with everybody. So they have a new insight of what is important in life, not external things like a lot of money, a big house, a big car, a young body. It's not important anymore. It's about helping people and feeling connected with other people. That's why. This kind of experience also are called experience of oneness. You know that you're connected with everybody else, you're connected with nature, you're connected with the planet Earth as well. And the third aspect of transformation is to enhance intuitive sensitivity. They, it has told you, they feel connected with other people and they even can know what other people think. They can have um, Premonition, they can have prognostic dreams. But they can know that someone will die in three weeks and they even will die as well. So they're very disturbed by these kind of experiences as well. Now, because of this transformation, we also did a longitudinal study with interviews two years and eight years after the cardiac arrest. And all patients were still were alive with an NDE. And a match control group of patients with the same age and time interval of patients who survived the cardiac arrest without an NDE. And what we found that the transformation that was talked about was only found in patients with a near death experience, which means the transformation is the objective aspect of the subjective experiences. We cannot prove subjective experiences. So, according to current science, 
we cannot prove what we think, what we feel. The current science is still materialist science, and they believe only that is what is true that you can objectify, which you can measure, which you can duplicate, which you can falsify. Now, what we think and feel, we cannot measure, we cannot objectify, we cannot duplicate, we cannot falsify. This conscious experiences, like the death experiences, are beyond the current materialist science as well. So we have to change science into an all-inclusive science, that we have to include consciousness to understand much more about the death experiences. Thank you, Pim. Thank you for such an extensive overview of uh, your work and the uh, near-death experiences. And Thank you for sharing how by having an open and curious scientific mind you've stepped over skepticism yourself and um, also thank you for all the work you've done in the field of near-death studies that prove that consciousness is outside of the body now let's talk to one more pr prominent specialist who has been documenting and researching ndes since 1998 and this is none other than the founder of uh, the Near Death Experience Research Foundation, Dr. Jeffrey Long, an American author and researcher into the phenomenon of near death experiences. A physician by training, Dr. Long practices radiation oncology at a hospital in Louisiana. You may know him as the author of Evidence of the Afterlife The Science of Near Death Experiences. Let's hear to Dr. Long. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. We've got a lot to talk about. Again, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Long. I'm a medical doctor whose medical specialty is radiation oncology, the use of radiation to treat cancer. But I'm also very busy in my activities through the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. This is a website and research project that's been up for over 20 years. We've received over 3,500 near-death experiences over the years. This is by far the largest publicly accessible collection of near-death experiences in the world. And because of the detailed survey with the questions we ask, we're learning more about near-death experiences than was ever possible before. The near-death experience is exactly what the phrase implies, you're near death. In other words, you're so physically compromised that you're unconscious or clinically dead with no heartbeat. At that time when you're unconscious, it should be impossible to have any kind of remembrance because, well, you're not conscious. And yet in a near-death experience, you do. You have a very lucid, organized remembrance that occurs at that time. The elements, what occurs during a near-death experience are very consistently observed across thousands of near-death experiences and all around the world. Uh, they're very consistently observed among many different researchers that have investigated near-death experiences. So I think first and foremost, one line of evidence for their reality is that they're so consistently observed what happens, the characteristics of a near-death experience uh, are remarkably the same. It doesn't seem to make any difference whether you're, say, a Christian in the United States or, say, a Muslim in Egypt or a Hindu in India, anywhere in the world that you have a near-death experience, what happens is going to be strikingly similar. There are several different lines of evidence for the reality of near-death experience. One of the most significant is they shouldn't happen at all. At the time of a heart attack, cardiac arrest, which just means that your heart stops beating, well, immediately at that time when your heart stops, blood immediately stops flowing to your brain. 10 to 20 seconds after that event, the EEG or electroencephalogram, which is a measure of brain cortex activity, goes absolutely flat it should be absolutely impossible to have any memory at that point in time. And yet by the hundreds, people that have cardiac arrests and near-death experiences at that time report them. Highly lucid, organized experiences, typically with greater consciousness and alertness than they had during their earthly everyday life. So that's one of the, the major lines of evidence for the reality of near-death experience. Another important line of evidence is it's common during near-death experiences for the first thing to happen is what's called an out-of-body experience. They're unconscious, they may be clinically dead, and yet commonly 
their consciousness separates from their physical earthly body and typically rises up above them. From that vantage point, they can see and often hear ongoing earthly events, often including frantic efforts of other people trying to resuscitate them and bring them back to the life. In my study of, uh, of, of several hundred out-of-body experiences occurring during near-death experiences, I found that what they were observing, yeah, what they saw, uh, even when they went back and tried to verify the accuracy of it later, when they recovered from what nearly killed them, was accurate down to the finest details in over 98% of the time. And don't forget, these are people that are unconscious or clinically dead at that time. And that is absolutely medically inexplicable. Moreover, many of these out-of-body observations may be far from their physical body, far beyond any possible physical sensory awareness. And yet, in the out-of-body observations, when they go and, and verify what they saw, almost invariably, again, it's accurate down to the finest detail. And there's no explanation of physical brain function that can possibly explain that. Another line of evidence for the reality of near-death experience is that people born totally blind have reported highly visual near-death experiences. I interviewed one such person, Vicki, and she had a bad car accident. Uh, she was being driven home from singing in a bar. And for the first time that she saw herself, she was in that out-of-body state over her body. And there she was on the gurney in the emergency room down below. She didn't even know what she was seeing until she correlated with her newfound sense of vision, a ring that her father had given her, and the feel of her long hair, which previously she had only known by the sense of touch. And yet there she was seeing. She described a stunningly visual near-death experience. In fact, her vision is what many people that have near-death experiences describe, 360 degrees vision. She could simultaneously see in front, back of her right, left, and up and down, all simultaneously aware of that visual information and processing it. In fact, when I talked with Vicki, she literally did not believe that those of us in her daily earthly life only see with like a pie-shaped vision because of the location of our eyes and our skull. I mean, she literally laughed at me. She said, no, that's not true. You, you see 360 degrees. So that was interesting talking to that. In my studies, we've gone on to have a small series of people that were severely visually impaired or legally blind at the time of their near-death experience. And in that series, I've studied invariably the vision they had during their near-death experience was at least as normal as their earthly everyday life, and actually most of the time super normal, uh, with ability to see even better than Vicky, like what Vicky described. Uh, seeing, being aware of, visually processing better than their earthly everyday life. So once again, absolutely medically inexplicable while you're unconscious or clinically dead, being having vision, sensory awareness that is beyond anything they've ever experienced in their life and beyond anything they literally thought was possible to happen to them or anybody else. And yet unconscious or clinically dead in a near-death experience, they're they're experiencing. And that certainly a very strong line of evidence for the reality of near-death experiences. Another important line of evidence for the reality of near-death experiences are those that occur while under general anesthesia. Of course, when you're under that blanket of sleep of adequate general anesthesia, they carefully monitor your heartbeat. In fact, sometimes your brain is so shut down, they have to artificially ventilate you. Believe me, as a doctor, I've been involved in that a lot. So sometimes the heart may stop due to a variety of reasons during anesthesia. Yes, it's very, very uncommon, but it does happen. Near-death experiences have been reported by the dozens as occurring at that time. And they are, by my research of investigating near-death experiences under anesthesia, they are essentially the same in terms of what happens during them as near-death experiences occurring any other, under any other circumstances. Uh, other than under general anesthesia. And a key question I asked for both the near-death experiences that occurred under general anesthesia and the near-death experiences occurring under all other, other circumstances was, well, what was your level of consciousness and alertness? And remarkably, between those two groups, there was no statistical difference whatsoever. It is astounding to me that even when you're under general anesthesia and your heart stops, 
that your degree of consciousness and alertness during the near-death experience is the same as near-death experiences occurring under other circumstances where you're not under general anesthesia. And may I add the substantial majority of people having near-death experiences in response to that survey question, about three-fourths say they're having even greater consciousness and alertness than they did during their earthly everyday life. So again, some of the more remarkable lines of evidence for the reality of near-death experience and its very consistent message of an afterlife. And, you know, and it's not, this isn't anecdotal. I think the important thing to remember about near-death experiences is these aren't just anecdotal reports. Approximately 10 to 20% of people who nearly die will have a near-death experience. So we estimate around the world there are literally millions of people that have had near-death experiences. Near-death experiences can happen to anybody. They happen to children and adults. They can happen to the old. They can happen to people, uh, regardless of their religious belief. And even atheists have near-death experiences. So they seem to be, if you will, an equal opportunity experience. To this day, and this has been well studied, we cannot predict who will have near-death experience when they nearly die, nor we can we predict what the content of the near-death experience will be. So it seems to be something operating completely independent of their expectations. Even people that have never heard of near-death experiences have near-death experiences just like everybody else. Many, many atheists in our study, they were atheists at the time of their near-death experience. We asked a very direct question about that in our most recent survey. Not surprisingly, virtually all of them after their near-death experience and after they have some years to think about it and understand it are no longer atheists. Um, they go on to have conventional beliefs, of, you know, like most other people in the world, that there really is life after death, that there really is meaning and purpose in our earthly life for all of us. We asked directly in our survey question if people having near-death experiences have any concept about earthly meaning and purpose. A surprisingly high percentage say yes, that they actually got information during their near-death experience that addresses that. And to summarize, near-death experiencers, when they do come to get special information, and again, this is directly during their near-death experience, they come with the understanding that near our li earthly lives are extremely important. They're extremely valuable. I, I do need to address skeptics. Everybody's going to hear this, uh, and as most people do, and say, okay, well, what, what are the skeptics saying? What are the, if you will, the scholarly thinking that underlies alternative explanations? So I'm going to address that for a little bit here because it's important. Over the decades since near-death experiences were first reported in 1975, skeptics of near-death experience have reported literally dozens of so-called explanations of near-death experience. I've heard every imaginable physiological, psychological, or cultural so-called explanation from skeptics that is imaginable. Now, the reason that there are literally dozens of these explanations floating around is very simple. And that is the skeptics of near-death experience as a group cannot come by consensus on any one or several of their own skeptical explanations that make sense to the skeptics as a group themselves. Over and over, people come up with these new ideas, and yet even the skeptics as a group cannot point to any explanation of near-death experience that explains the totality of what's observed in near-death experience. And in fact, if you study the skeptical explanations, they don't sh explain anything that we've shared today. Uh, they simply can't. So not surprisingly, year after year, skeptics keep coming up with more and more explanations, uh, different explanations, because all the other explanations brought up over decades can't even come close to explaining anything that's described in near-death experiences, let alone the totality of everything that happens. And that, that's important. That's an important concept. By a basic tenet of science, what's real is consistently observed, and we're there in near-death experiences. I'm convinced, even as a near-death experience researcher, that what we don't know about near-death experience far outweighs what we do know. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you for providing us with uh, these uh, impossible to deny uh, and uh, proven, verified cases of uh, near-death experiences and um, I would agree that yes, indeed, people working in the medical field probably often encounter such cases, but not everyone believes the stories of uh, the patients 
And uh, now we will hear from a doctor who uh, himself was uh, skeptical, but then had the experience himself. And please welcome Dr. Eben Alexander, the author of Proof of Heaven, a neurosurgeon's journey into the afterlife, who had a near-death experience in 2008. First of all, I'd like to say hello, and I'm very grateful to be involved in this beautiful conference. I love what you all are doing for the world, so uh, great to be here. Uh, yeah, just to cut to the chase, I was uh, a materialist neuroscientist, uh, fully believed in uh, kind of brain creates consciousness. Uh, that's how I dealt with all of this, even though my patients had tried to share their own spiritual experiences with me. I would just kind of pat them on the back and say, yes, the Dying brain plays all kinds of tricks. That's what my doctors told me when I came back and tried to share my story. But what did happen was I went deep into coma over just a few hours early in the morning, November 10th, 2008. Uh, I think the important thing to point out about that is memories are clearly not stored in the physical brain. That's something that's become apparent to neurosurgeons over the last century because of millions of brain resections around the world uh, where there was never a case of definable a swathe of uh, long-term memories that disappeared with any kind of resection of brain. It just never happened. Uh, and uh, now you can damage medial temporal lobes, the hippocampus. So this is all data that came out of the early 1950s um, uh, with a certain operation uh, by uh, William Scoville, uh, where he uh, found a horrible uh, inability of a patient to convert short-term to long-term memories. Uh, once he had bilateral damage to the uh, medial temporal lobe. And so that's a known fact, but it has nothing to do with removing long-term memories. Uh, that's the important thing. And especially when you get the reality of these reincarnation cases, more than 2,500, many of them kind of shocking in their nature of, of how much quality, uh, you know, the child was, remember, was able to remember of a past life. Uh, I mean, really astonishing. And of course, many of these came before the internet. Uh, so uh, there was no, and the, and the physicians who investigate them are, are deeply uh, protective of, of fraud and uh, kind of anybody trying to mislead themselves or mislead the uh, investigators. Um, so it really uh, kind of opens the door to memory being, you know, stored. Thank you for sharing your experience, Dr. Ibn Alexander. You have raised a very important questions. If long-term memory persists regardless of brain damage, and it also persists even after the death of the body, then consciousness must exist after the death of the physical body. So how is memory preserved after the death of the body? And where is it stored? Um, Dr. Alexander mentioned cases of reincarnation that cannot be explained without knowledge of the human structure, which we discussed at the beginning. In particular, about such a concept is subpersonality. Today, we will see this in the example of confirmed cases of reincarnation, where children and adults recall past lives which is essentially a manifestation of subpersonalities. What we hear today, what is voiced by the speakers of the conference, outstanding scientists, is important knowledge. In order to understand and find the answers to the question, who is a human being? And for 6,000 years, we have lived in a consumerist society for these 6,000 years, a person has been associated with the physical body. And it turns out that a person is much more. Not only are we the body, but we have also come to the understanding that consciousness is outside of the body. Next, we will talk about the fact that a person is not only consciousness, that there is much more important concept of a person which is a personality. This is who the person truly is. But why are we not told that human is a personality, a spirit? It is only now that we as humanity are coming to an understanding that consciousness is outside of the body. And this is already an incredible discovery. Although this was known from the time immemorial, 
But what is even more interesting is why people are not told that a human being is a spirit. After all, the prophets spoke about it. It is said in different religions of the world. And there is scientific evidence for this.